today, let's get deep and dirty into the technology. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today we're making a behind the scenes episode with George. Hi George. Hello Martin, how are you? I'm pretty good, great to have you on. And uh, of course you have a significant pedigree in television production. So I thought it would be good to have a bit of a chat about some of the things that go on behind the scenes and you've got some perspectives in terms of what works and what doesn't and uh, see where it goes. I think it's going to be great Martin. Um, what I'd like to start with for the audience is just to say one thing and that is light is invisible. <laughs> now, <you> probably <laughs> right. won't. And some people will say well no I can see the lights when I turn, turn them on but right now there's a laser that's going straight across the front of my face and of course you can't see it and the reason you can't see it is because we've got to reflect something like smoke or steam uh, before that laser will appear. So we have a little thing here called a smoke machine. <laughs> so just to prove the point to the viewers, just to show you how important reflection is to make light appear, like it reflects off my face, we're going to show the viewers where that laser is. Now watch this. Okay, there we are. You can see the laser right there. Um, we'll just let the smoke drop off a bit. But you can see it right there. There it is on my hand. And the smoke actually makes it appear right across my face. Just a little bit of a background on myself. Um, I uh, started uh, in television production in 1977. And I did a 20 year straight stint uh, to 1997 I was a sound person not a camera person uh, I developed a bit of an interest in camera because the cameraman I worked with actually said why don't you shoot the next story and I thought oh it seems simple enough I'd been working with him for 13 odd years at that stage on and off so I did shoot the first story and I said to him after I shot it I didn't know that doing filming was so 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 much fun <laughs> so that's what started me my interest into camera but my God, I had a lot to learn. I thought it was simple on the surface, but really, honestly, Martin, the people who are at the top of this game, they see things in a completely different manner. And all they're trying to do is just make the picture uh, stand out and to develop interest in the frame that keeps the viewer glued to the screen. And having done all of that, you could say a photographer does that too, because they take a photo and the only process is to focus the attention again on their frame. But the real art form is the content that you produce. And so all of this lovely technicality stuff that we talk about, I mean seriously, uh, it's only there to aid the message and to aid the content. It's not there to become the content. Mm. I don't know if you've ever been in a forest and sometimes you'll see rays of light coming from the trees. Yep. Well, that's the mist in the air and the beams of light are breaking through the trees and they're creating like little, little beams. Mm. And what happens as the, as the mist, as the beams hit the mist, you actually see the shapes of that, of that mist. It's like having, when you look up at the clouds sometimes and you'll see rays of light coming down in the, in the distance. It's the same thing. There's mist in the air, the clouds have little openings, the light then breaks through those openings and comes down, and the fog, you could say, picks up that light and reveals it in its little, in its little beams. And that's what happens when people use like laser lights for discotheques, etc., or moving lights. They smoke the whole room so that the light is revealed. And it's the smoke that the light hits that it reflects that creates the look. That's what happens. But we're here to talk about studios, your studio in particular, and generally what studio, why people use studios, why do, um, why do actual TV stations set up studios? The answer to this is they will go in and they'll do an interview over a period of time 
And the best way to control the light so that it, that interview has continuity through the whole process is to black the whole room out so there's no other light sources come in. And now you create your own light sources which are constant. And then those light sources light your face and the room and they give you a look. And from there, you could be interviewing somebody for, say, 10 o'clock. Stop the interview, go, go for lunch, come back in, sit them down in the same place. Continue the interview, and as long as they haven't changed their clothing or <laughs> put on a hat or had a, had, a, had a haircut in the meantime, you'll come back in the studio and the lighting conditions are, are identical. But let's take the typical one where somebody will say, I don't need all that, I'll just take a person into a lounge room. I'll sit them up and we'll do the interview. It might last three hours. Now, in the meantime, the window's open. Oh, leave it. There's plenty of light. That's good. We're using that light. And three hours later, the sun's kind of, the clouds have come over, the room's gone dark, and they're saying, what happened to the light? And you think, well, if you understood what, why you block out light and why you relight, you would then understand the reason. And people have to make these mistakes, I suppose, um, in the process of, of learning. But the people who know it, they haven't got the time to be bothered by that. They've got too much to do and they really have to focus on doing the job at hand. And so, presto, they invented the studio. And what did they do in the studio? They thought, we're not gonna muck around here. We wanna make our life easy. So you will find in a television studio, you'll walk in and you won't see light stands or anything like that around the room. There's a great big truss over the ceiling. In that truss, you'll see a whole lot of lights and what they'll do is, just before the interview happens, they'll decide who's going to sit where. The lighting guy will come in and he'll say, right, we need to put a light there. We need to turn that one slightly this way. Sit down there. Great, you're lit. They'll light the background. They'll work out where the cameras are. They'll work out what look they want behind the camera. What they're going to put there, i.e. there's a camera here. It just so happens. <laughs> they just happen to kind of just jump up because <laughs> of the look. Um, and that gives the viewer an indication of, oh, okay, they're they must be talking about cameras because there's a camera there. Mm -hmm. See? So you, on the other hand, you've gone for the green screen. With a green screen, you can have one of these behind you if you ever wanted to. You can put anything behind you because... Ah, uh, that's the beauty of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the thing about green screens mm -hmm. um, is you can always flick the backgrounds. I mean, would you like a sunset? Easy. There you go. Oh, nice. Yes, that oh, is that, nice. That's, that's a, f a photo I took a few years ago uh, in, in Sydney. Beautiful. Or, um, you know, if you want a beach scene, you could have that. You oh, know? very nice. Okay, I'll put on the <laughs> uh, slip slop slap. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the, the point is that um, to get that to look right yep. is actually not easy, right? So, so quite often when you see people messing around with green screens early on, you'll see it's all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. um, because... There's a bunch of things you have to get right to make a green screen actually work, right? Um, and I reckon I've spent oh, not a lot of money, but a lot of time carefully tweaking and trying to get it to look as natural as I can um, whilst still being able to make it usable because I need something I can just turn on and it happen. I understand that, Martin. I, I, uh... Uh, that's what you would do, especially in your case. You want about a walk in the room. The lights are all set up in the correct positions yeah. for your on camera. Yeah. And then so occasionally you'll do an interview and you'll have to relight for the interview because you're going to have different oh, I've positions. Got, I've got another spot over the other side where I set of up course, for interviews. Of um, so it occurs to me that it might be useful if I switch across to this view, right? So this is actually the studio, right? Yep. And so you can basically see me sitting at my desk. I've got some computers and things in front. I've got a bit mm -hmm. of technology. And I've got some lights up above, which are actually deliberately above the eye line. That's because mm -hmm. I've got specs. So you've got to have the lights beside and above rather than... Otherwise, you just get lights every, light everywhere, right? Yep. And there's a green screen behind. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get up and I'm going to sort of start wiggling the other camera. Mm-hmm. That's okay. And just give you a little bit of a tour. Take your time. Take your time. Around, around what we've actually got here. Yeah. Um, to do that, I'm going to unplug the power lead first. Here You're trying go. to show the green screen. All right. So, so this is the green screen, right? So this is the first place. I'm just going to zoom out. Yeah. Can you see how the green screen is keying the same color? 
Yes, I can see that. Right? I can Isn't see that clever? That. It is very clever. Right? And that's just green screen, so yep. that's just picking up the key. Yep. But if you actually come back, yep. actually the green screen isn't green at all. Uh, it, it is green, but it's actually uh, just a piece of metal frame yep. and then just a, a, a piece of cloth over the top of it, right? So that's that. Then what I've got is I've got these lights. Yep. So these are actually no less than LEDs. four lights. They're LED lights? They're, they're LED lights. They're 5600. Okay, for those people who don't understand 5600, what Martin is t telling us is that the, the colour temperature is in Kelvin. 5600 degrees Kelvin is midday New York uh, daylight. That's what it's based on. And so you can use any colour you like. Um, and then you've got the other colour, which is orange, which is tungsten. Um, but it doesn't matter. As long as the colours stay the same, you can key the background uh, using the same colour. And as long as the light on the background and the light on Martin's face are of a similar intensity, the key will work. Yep. And it's interesting because if I swing the camera around, yes. even from this angle, you can see, you see you've got a pretty perfect key again. Yes. So yeah, I can it's see that. set up reasonably well. Now, over the, over the other side there, I've got my um, main camera. Yep. Right. In fact, there are two cameras. The one that's got the auto cue in the front. Yep. Is actually a, a Sony camera. That's my main camera. That's auto focus. Yep. I've also got um, next to it another camera, which is an older Black Magic one, which is my standby camera if things fail. So that's the way that that works. Yep. I've got um, as as well as the ATM control software which we'll come on to because there's a switcher involved yep. above it I've actually got a couple of scopes and this is a really useful thing because it shows me what the audio is doing and it shows me what the picture is doing so I can get the levels right yep yeah I understand that now this is a bit technical for the average person by the way um, <laughs> when you're talking about this I, I get where you're going with this I, I understand it but for the less techni technically oriented people um, just so they know, what Martin is doing in his room is pretty much the same as any television studio would do to run multiple cameras and to do your 7.30 reports and your this day tonight or whatever show that they want, a current affair. They use the same techniques. The only difference is Martin doesn't have somebody to help him. So if you imagine Tracy Grimshaw sitting in front of the camera... But instead of Tracy Grimshaw, you know, with all the accolades and all of the features and all of the help that she gets, um, Martin steps in and he runs the studio from where he is while he's talking to camera. <laughs> so he is the crew, the sound person, the lighting person, the camera person, the director and the presenter. <laughs> Yep. I think that's Conf pretty clever myself. I think yeah, it's a suit to nuts. And, and there's a few little things that help me. The first one is we have what's called a production switcher, which is the unit down here, right? Okay. So the production switcher is the thing that takes all the camera feeds yep. and the other audio feeds and basically pipes them around and produces the, uh, the, the stuff at the end. Can right? you tell so me that, the, what the switcher brand and, and model that, is? So that's, so that's the Black Magic. Yes. And it's the... Um, 4K Pro television one. And the beauty of that is it's got physical buttons, right? A, yep. lo a lot of the Black Magic ones only use virtual buttons, but I quite like the physical buttons. So I can literally switch from camera to camera using the physical buttons if all else fails, right? So that's right. the first part of the kit. The second part of the kit, which I'm going to go over here, I don't know whether you can see that. I can't move. Yes, I can. There. Okay, so I also have um, a control system to allow me to switch my video hub so there's a routing electronic routing which allows me to put signals it where I want them so yep. that's the other, and then the third element I've got um, is over at the back there so that's let me go over there you can see it. it's a bit small can I pull that further oh nearly pulled something else over, so right, over it there gently oh yes I see your radio mic receiver and your mixer so yeah so behind the radio mic is actually the pull too that's the streamer so that's how we actually get to the internet. So at the end of the, at the, end of the process, mm -hmm. that's a recorder. Yep. And it records each of the isolated streams on its own and also goes to the internet. Right. Right? 
Your, your man, mixer, by the way, does that is that able to record ISO tracks as well? Uh, it could do if I put the ISO tracks out to USB. It doesn't have a built-in recorder. The reason I've got that, because my main microphone, which I'm not using tonight, is this one here, right? So this is, this is my broadcast studio mic, and I need just to turn that on. So if I put that on, you'll hear that the audio is quite different now. Yes, I can hear that. Yeah, uh, much, much better quality. This has also got things like compression and ah, yeah. limiters and gates and things. Yep. So I can Take control how the audio sounds, yes, yes. and that's quite important, uh, particularly when you're going live to air. So mm -hmm. I'm using a, a lav mic to mic. Which, yes. um, isn't as good a quality uh, which as what microphone, I normally do. When you say you're using a lav mic, I know you're using the Deity radio mic system, which, by the way, folks, I have looked at this system. A lot of professionals tend to use Sennheiser. Uh, the really top-end stuff tends to be electrosonic. We're getting into high-end stuff where you're spending $6,000 just for one radio mic. Um, but the Deity is really quite impressive. Um, we uh, think of the r microphone system or the transmitter receiver as the camera body and think of the neck mic as the lens question here is are you using deity's um uh, no, uh a supplied microphone or have you gone and replaced it with one of your own martin uh the, the answer to that to george is at the moment i'm using the deity mic okay all right so they're okay they're not they're not the, the work best work, work no that's best, all right but they're, they're actually not bad now one of the things i wanted to share with you yep because this is a, this is one of my secret weapons, right? Oh, I like so secret I'm now weapons. looking at my auto cue. Yep. And as you may be able to see, that I can now see what you are seeing to me. So in other words, I'm talking to you yep. on my auto cue. So that allows me to have eye contact, right? When yep. I'm all, when I'm talking on Skype and on Zoom. Right. Right. Okay. And that auto cue also allows me to read off it for script as well if I want to read uh, script, right? Yep, yep. So, so that in a nutshell is the studio. <laughs> okay. Now, one thing I will say, we're talking about audio, so let's go, because I'm an audio person by, by profession, and you're using sound devices uh, auto mix, aren't you? We're not, not in this particular case, but when you do your interviews with J one John Adams, for example, Correct. Um, you are now, you once, once you do that, you then often you'll use two microphones, um, usually overhead microphones, a bit like, here we go, this one, you can see the microphone here. Uh, so, uh, the problem you have when you start to introduce two microphones is that you get a, th a little thing called mic spill. In other words, my voice travels and is picked up by this microphone, but there's the microphone by the person I'm interviewing and that my voice also travels to their microphone. And so when it mixes, when you mix these two microphones together, the problem you'll often have is that the sound will become color, colored or, you know, you'll get a thing called coloration. And that'll be the fact that the voice travels, the sound waves hit this microphone like a, the ABC sign, you know, the ABC sign. Uh, but that sound wave kind of starts like this and as it travels, it reduces its wave. And by the time it gets to the other person's microphone, it still has some power in it. But what happens when that microphone picks up my voice is the two sound sources are then joined together, and that's what causes a discoloration uh, in the case. It sounds, to give the viewers an idea, if that happens, you'll sound like you've walked into a bathroom. And when you clap your hands in a bathroom, you get this ringing sound and that's called reverberation. So it gives you that kind of ringing sound. But what happens when you use the auto mix on the sound devices unit that Martin is using, the unit detects that your voice is down at the other microphone and says, I don't want that guy. No, no, turn that microphone down. I just keep the one he's talking on up. And then as soon as I talk and say, you're talking to John Adams, so John now starts speaking. John's microphone opens up and my microphone gets shut down. The sound becomes a lot clearer and it all adds to the clarity of the sound. Now the thing about all of this is doing all of these wonderful things with lighting and sound uh, in a studio gives you consistency. It takes away distraction because what you're trying to do is you're trying to avoid distraction. So by taking away distraction and making the lighting right and making the sound right, I'm starting to talk a bit like Bill Gates. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> um, I have to put the hands down. 
uh, what happens when you take away the distraction, the real focus should be on the content of, of the program. Because it's the content that has people watching. It's not how clever the sound is and how clever the lighting is and how clever the studio is. Although it is very clever, by the way. Um, it's actually about the content. And I've said to people in my industry, journalists who say, I've got to have a studio and I've got to have the lights and I've got to... I said, do you know that there's a man over in Canada and he talks to, ca to his laptop. It's fairly cheap. He's got good sound. He may have put an accessory camera in to get the quality up. And he gets 100,000 hits regularly. And he doesn't have the studio. He doesn't have the fancy cameras. He doesn't have the fancy sound. And what does it prove? It proves that there's an audience out there who love content. And it's the content that matters. Hence, we have the fabulous, inequitable Martin North <laughs> at the other end. <laughs> who's talking about this stuff, and what Martin does really, really well, and the audience knows this, is he gives them information that they are interested in, and he says it in an eloquent way, and um, allows the audience to partake in the conversation through the comment section. And yes, some people will say, ah, don't agree with you, but that's the lovely, that's the beauty of the whole thing, is that we actually have conversations, and we take people with higher levels of knowledge, and we use that knowledge to impart it out to the audience, to let the audience engage and maybe look at things from a slightly different perspective. What do yeah. you think, Martin? No, no well, that's exactly right. So, you know, the DFA is meant to be effectively not something which is propagandist in terms of a particular point of view, but trying to use data to be able to inform people and to paint well, different pictures yes, I, and all those things, right? I, I yeah. agree. I, mm. I think that uh, the one thing that attracted to me to you the first time I saw your program, uh, and I also saw John Adams, was that you were talking about a subject that I was really curious about, and that was economics. And the reason I was curious about it was because at the time, now we're going a little bit off the studio here, folks, but we're actually going into content within the studio. <laughs> but the reason I was so interested, Martin, was because I'd looked at what happened at the GFC and I thought, there's something terribly wrong here. And I thought, I call it a hunch, but... Uh, I said to you, Martin, are all the central banks printing money together because the cross rates are stable and for some reason there doesn't seem... We're getting some form of inflation. It's going into things like real estate. We keep having this growth. But why, is it, why do the cross rates stay the same? And then I figured out, well, hang on, what if all the central banks are printing at the same time? Of course, the cross rates would stay similar, surely. And you answered, correct? <laughs> well, the answer is, of course, that's exactly what they're doing and everyone is doing the same dance. Okay. And I asked John Adams the same question. And John Adams said to me, and I give, I give, I think John Adams is often harshly treated and I have to say I, I have a lot of respect for John Adams. So if John, you're listening, you've got my attention. I think John Adams is spot on with what he says. But of course, we can't control... <laughs> what the international bankers and the governments around the world are going to do. So when we make some idea or, you know, you've got, who was that man that, uh, from America that you have on who's, who had the highest rating, what's his, who? What, you mean Harry? Harry yeah, Harry Dent. Harry Dent, yeah. Okay, Harry Dent's very popular, very well respected, mm. and Harry mm. makes these allegations too. And the, the, there's nothing wrong with what he says, but the, and I think Harry's on, the, on point, the trouble is, we don't know when, <laughs> when this is all going to happen. I feel, like, I feel like there's a fuse that's been lit, and in the process of the fuse being lit, something is going to go bang <laughs> in the future. That's what I feel like. Martin, your studio is uh, really well set up. <laughs> uh, so, so you asked about how do I control it all, right? Yeah. So it, th there's one thing which um, I need to explain, right? Yep. The ATEM, which is essentially the, soft, the software control, I'm just going to drop this over onto the screen so that effectively mm -hmm. uh, on my recording, yep. uh, I can then record the screen. That's okay. There we go. So there. So this is actually the software control for all of the switching and everything else, yeah, right? So everything is... Now, what, what's fascinating about this is I can control every aspect. I can switch cameras, yep. right? 
I can um, apply different effects yeah. and all the other things, all from the software control. Now, to make that work, I then couple it with, uh, would you believe, some other software that comes out to a series of buttons on what, what's called a stream deck. Right? Ah, yeah. And a stream deck um, is essentially a series of buttons that runs macros that control things. Right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I want to switch from this camera to the other camera, mm -hmm. I push a button and it yeah. all happens, right? Sure. And behind <laughs> the scenes, what I've done now is I've cut from camera one to camera two, mm -hmm. but I've also made adjustments to a lot of settings mm -hmm. because the settings on that camera need to be different to the one that's the main camera, but it's all automatic, right? Now, and stay, I come back. stay on that picture for a second. If you can go back, I want to point something out. Yeah. This yeah, might yeah. help you. Do you yeah. see over your right shoulder, look at the wall. Yeah. You can have a look. You know, you know what I'm talking about, the, with the picture on it. Over here? Yeah, yeah it's that whole yeah. white wall, or, yeah. or beige wall. Yeah. No, that's a bit of a problem for your green screen studio. Well. Now, you know why? <laughs> well, because it's the wrong color. <laughs> we go back to the point where I mentioned light reflects. Yeah. And what happens, of course, is if you light the green screen behind you, that, that green screen not only lights up, but it also reflects light, so light Correct. bounces off it. So yep. what happens now is the green screen will tend to light up that wall as well. Yep. So what they do in studios is they'll put a black curtain in. That's typical. Yep. Uh, I would say being gr to neutralise green, the opposite of green is red. If I was going to put a curtain in for green screen, it would probably be a deep maroon, not mm. a black. Yep. So you know. Well, the, the, the way I get around that, if I... Go yes, back to go my, so this is my main picture, right? Yes. Because yep. what I actually do is I use some of the software control okay. to be able to deal with, and I'm just going to put this back up. What they on call the green spill? Because it's actually spilling onto you. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go so on. basically, there's a series of adjustments. So you can adjust the what's called the foreground, which yep. I, I, I make some minor adjustments on. Yeah. Um, I don't uh, change the key edge because the uh, lighting works really well. Yep. But look at here. The flare suppression, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, it works best at around 10, mm -hmm. right? And down here, you can see I've taken the green down about 15%. Yep, yep. Right? And what's interesting is that if I actually drop those settings down, which I'll, I'll just now do so you can see the effect, yeah. you can see that the um, my picture then starts to look a bit wonky, right? So if mm -hmm. I put the green back to normal, which oh, is yeah, there. Yeah, I can see. I can see the green going right. around. So, you know, around so, your so basically, so. I go green. Yes, right? yes, you do. And if I take the flare suppression down, yep. um, and things like that, I can end up with essentially semi trans You see, semi I'm now semi-transparent. Oh, yeah, right? yeah. Right? Right? Yeah. Now, it just shows you that you need to be able to set it right. Of course. Right, so it's now back where it was. So that's the that's my sort of current look, right, which takes the green out. Sure. Uh, hopefully makes me look relatively natural. You do, um, you do. And the other thing to say is that I've also messed with the color settings, mm -hmm. the white balance on the camera. Yep, yep. So I didn't just do an auto white balance because it made me look a little pale. So I've actually swung the white balance a little bit to just make me a little bit more sort of, um, hopefully, you know, healthy looking. <laughs> well, then I guess that you, you know, the Kelvin color, color temperature we talked about, I'm uh, guessing uh, that you went a bit higher, maybe about 6,000 degrees Kelvin? Correct. Okay. Yep. That was a bit yeah, of a yeah. guess, but, um, but yeah, yeah, 56 no. is what you said to. If you go up to 6,000 or maybe yep. a bit higher, it'll yeah, warm no. up the facial tones Cor and make you look healthier. Correct. And I found that from, from, you know, from my complexion and my sort of colored hair and things. Right. Um, that work. The other thing I just want to mention yeah. is the hair light, right? Because I think it's actually quite important. Um, if you take the hair light off, yeah, yeah, right? it makes the whole thing just a lot flatter, right? Still works all right. Yeah. Uh, and the, the camera adjusts automatically yeah. to the different light levels and things. Right. But the hair light, I think, is actually quite important. But you don't want it too strong, but you no, want no, it no. strong ish. Yep. Um, and that also lights independently yep. 
the green screen behind of of it. Now, the other point to make is, I don't know, what you should have is a, at least three, four feet between you and the green screen, right? That would be Ideally the idea. Ideally would be good, yes, at least. Yeah, get, but I've got an elbow's distance. Oh, uh, yeah, I know. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> for the people out there who don't, who make, might, might not quite understand green screen, in the ideal world, three or four feet is the poor man's green screen. An elbow is the starving um, Nigerian's <laughs> dream. <laughs> And when you go into, say, a Hollywood studio, the room is so big that by the time the, light, the person that they're filming is actually standing in this massive studio, imagine a huge warehouse the size of Bunnings, okay? Mm. And they've got a massive green screen, because this is what they do. By the time that light gets to them, it's dissipated, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> and so you don't have that problem. Um, yep. So backlights are usually put in to take the green out and what they'll do is they'll put with a backlight if you're using say um, a certain colour of lights and the backlight is also the same colour what you'll do is you'll put like an orange gel in front of the backlight mm. and that will warm the colour hitting the back of your hair and it neutralises the green spill. So yep. you, that's the reason you do it. And Martin is right. You don't want it too strong because then you have your hair frizzing away. <laughs> it's not necessary. Um, so that, that's the reason you use a backlight. If mm. you had the space, you wouldn't need one. No, no not, indeed. But... Not to say you couldn't use one. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. It's, but you'd have the choice of using one. You could decide, no, I want a backlight because that's the look I want. But, but that's your choice. In, the, in this case, when you've got an elbow length behind you, you really don't have. Uh, the best solution is a backlight, and that's what Martin's done. Now, yeah, well, I don't know if you wanted to got. talk about production at all, uh, uh, Martin, Did you, or do you, you think we've kind of... Well, I was just going to say there's a few other things which I, I'll just okay. share with you. Uh, so so the, the first is that, um, as well as what I've shown you here, there's also um, some other kit which is actually in a different room mm -hmm. because it's too noisy. Yep. And one of those things is I think called a hyperdeck, and a hyperdeck is essentially a, a, a fancy um, video recorder and player, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the buttons that I've got on my stream deck, mm -hmm. if I push it, right, I now I, then pl I, then, I now then play oh, that's the introduction, nice. yeah. right? And so that stream that streams automatically. Yep. Um, and uh, just plays the uh, the normal sig tune, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then when it's done, it then comes back to me. I love That's it. That's all, all automatic, right? I love it. Um, <laughs> another one I've got is my pre-roll, so I can basically do my countdown, mm -hmm. right? So it counts down to the start of the show, and it runs for 30 minutes and then just automatically comes back, right? Um, and I've <laughs> even got things like... <laughs> That's all right. I can, go on. I can make the globe go round. Now, I tried that on one show, and people hated it. So oh, really? I, I yeah, quite yeah. I like it, actually. Well, here you go. Well, so we'll leave it look, on. You know what it is? I think, right. uh, I think, as, I think what, this is a little tip for you, by the way. I think yeah. if you started with that in the background, and it slowly twisted around to a picture of Australia, and then froze, <laughs> yeah. if you could do that, just a little tip. I reckon you get people's attention. <laughs> yeah, well, I did try, and in fact, if you, if, you, um, if you look, you can see that it actually stopped pretty much on Australia, right? So that, that, that already is the way yeah. it runs. So <laughs> the intro plays and stops. So. But it's interesting how people, you know, like it differently. The other thing I've got, of course, over on another computer yep. is a whole bunch of other things, like, for example, the, this, these messages and things, right? Oh, good. So I can actually present them. They come in on a different channel and are effectively on an overlay. So they're available all the time. Um, and I can do things like showing the chat. Hmm. You know, when I've got a live stream, I can show the chat. I can run specific slides like this. God, this is really interesting. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> yeah. Um, and all of those things. And I can even um, play oh videos, God. right? From over there, so this is actually my, you know, just the sort of the intro. There you go. It's so, quite neat, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's not bad, is it? I quite um, like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was so, just thinking, um, what happens? Um, just a little hint. <laughs> hmm. You could actually have something like economic crash, and then you see little nuclear explosions <laughs> happening around the world. <laughs> that even CNN would be impressed with that. They say, "Geez, he's outdoing us." 
<laughs> what do you think, Martin? Well, it's an idea. Yes, now at the moment I'm just trying Little to work out why that. Crowds, crowds are here there you go. Day. Yeah, oh, yeah, folks, yeah. Well, we're as we're having as we're, a reset, as we're, folks, we're having a reset. As, as with all of these things, you know, it's it's a question of then what what, what do you do with it? And it's it's interesting because you know I can I can put you know things like my one to one service right. So there's a slide on that right. That's nice. I, I can put up things like. Um, um, you know, new YouTube, you know, all, all that sort of stuff, right? Anytime I want. And it, all of that's being controlled from my stream deck, right? So right. There's, there's macros and there's content. And, and that, to me, is actually what really makes the difference between a shonky show and one that has slightly higher production values. And I've even been playing with things like that, right? Mm. Where effectively you get a little bit of... Um, you know, fun coming in and coming oh, out. Good. Right? I think that's it. I mean, look, I've watched you from the start, Martin. So uh, when you first started, you were kind of like getting a thousand, and then a, you got two thousand. And I thought, oh my God, he's going up in the world. And then one day it jumped to five thousand. I thought, oh my God, he's really improving. And then finally it got to ten thousand. I thought, I think he's getting an audience. And um, and I think the reason that you get your audience, Martin, is because you do offer a light humour in what you're talking about. You don't make it comical, but there's a little bit of a little bit of a subtlety there, <laughs> which I think the audience likes because they. I mean, let's face it. I mean, sometimes economics could be pretty depressing if you think about it. And if we don't add something in the mix to kind of maybe throw in a little question every now and then to kind of let the audience go, oh, that's a good point. <laughs> I like um, that's what I was actually thinking that in the back of my mind. He goes and tells it to me, and uh, and sure enough, they're going. I'm glad you actually mentioned that because that was because they don't get to speak, so we have to try to figure out the questions that they're thinking and add them. But you cannot get everybody in the audience on board because unfortunately, the problem with uh, society as we have it is it's very. Um, there's a lot of political motivation and and let's just say we have uh, beliefs that things are really quite simple. I mean, I have people say to me, I can do your job. I've got my iPhone. <laughs> I go, uh, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> have you won a national award with your iPhone? Uh, well, no, I don't need that. I said, I've won a national award for a music video that I produced. Uh, and that was against the best people in Australia. So... This is not to kind of pat myself on the back, but I mean, if I'm good at what I do, I should be able to achieve things like that, and I can. It just comes down to having the opportunities. And I think that, Martin, your, uh, your show works. It's actually quite slick in its presentation. I mean, you don't need to be that slick, but it's all part of the show. It's all part of the content. And we did well, say content. Don't is tell key. anybody, but I actually quite enjoy the technology as well. So I like playing oh, with this stuff. Right? <laughs> I got that impression because I don't know many people who go that far. And you've got mm. what the A9? Uh, what is it? The new? Which it's the Sony A9 camera, which is a re, you know it, a second-hand one, but it's doesn't uh, it matter. Was, now that it, camera, the, by the way, folks, that Martin's talking about, it's a cinema camera, and mm. you can put uh, all sorts of lenses on it. Just like this TV camera here, I can change the lenses on that. But once you get to high-end production, they actually have specific focal lengths that they put on the camera. And they simply take one lens off, which yep. might be a close-up so, lens so, to a wide so this lens. So is, this, is, this is a 55 full frame. 55, uh, okay. F1.8. F so oh, it's, wow. it's quite narrow depth of field. Yes. Yeah. And the well, beauty it of it... Be. It depends on what f-stop you decide to use. Yeah, well, that, that, that's true, but I've got it on f1.8 at the moment, oh, okay. right? Wow. So, so, so the point is there that the autofocus on the A9 is good enough to be able to track me so if I go forwards and backwards, right? It keeps me in focus. Yeah. And, and what you can't see is a little box around my face and around my eye, and it tracks the eye, right? That's one of the reasons why I'm using this one. Now, if I go over to my other camera... So I, I told you I had a black magic camera, mm -hmm. right? Now if, yeah, if let's I, have um, a look at the black magic. Yeah. So Do they match just, up quite well? Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. Okay. okay so All this right. is camera one. There you go. Okay. So there's a bit of a so, mismatch there. I so can see it. the thing about the black magic camera yep. is that you can actually oh wow I can see auto grade on the oh on wow the, that's impressive. <laughs> so 
So yeah, and and, and uh, I haven't really messed around with it, right? But but if if I was using it for serious work, I would match them, right? So that they look better. Than, so would you previous. use a vector scope for that? Yeah, well, that's what the scope that I showed okay. you earlier on. I've okay. actually got in in the Black Magic. Um, series, those scopes mm. have various different configurations, yeah, yeah. including the, the vector scope, which is very useful yeah. for matching cameras. I'll put that the other one, there you go. So that's the okay. but, and, and I use really the, um, the black magic one is just there in case this one right. for any reason falls over. Now just a little over. tip for the guys, for people out there who probably think, oh there's so many different cameras, etc. Which one, which camera do you buy? I mean, there's so many. And I could tell you, I could say for the average person who want something that really works well that I know of uh, that's not outlandish like it's probably something an average consumer could afford if they're serious about this uh, this technology um, Sony's Alpha 6500 uh, has one of the best autofocus systems I've seen and so much so uh, for people who wonder about how these things work if you take a 200 mil which is a bit of a zoom it's kind of zoomed right in and you shoot at f28 which is a really it's wide open aperture which now means that the, the focus becomes critical you can point that camera at a rally car coming at you at 100 kilometers an hour keep the focal length and go right on the badge of the car it will track the focus at a car coming at you at 100 kilometers an hour now that's a lot <laughs> That's incredible for such a tiny little camera called the Sony Alpha 6500. I'm not a Sony dealer. It's just that I do watch things like this. And yes, that camera does some pretty amazing things. But this, the technology to give people an understanding of what's happened since the time I started to today. <laughs> okay, so we went from standard definition to widescreen, which we're using today. And then we went to high definition about year 2000 and the first high definition cameras came out we now increased the resolution four times at 2k and when we went to 4k we continued to increase the resolution another four times now if you actually think about that 4k has 16 times higher resolution than the early standard definition technology that means you could digitally zoom into the corner of the screen and you could blow that up to full frame and you still have the same picture resolution as the old standard broadcast system had. That's how far the technology is going. And now 8K <laughs> is coming and 8K will go another four times. And if you consider that, what's that now going to be? It's going to be 16, 16, 64 times zoom range. <laughs> to get to that little corner to blow it up to... So that means that you've got amazing um, uh, control and for the people who work in production, that means that I can, I can edit my picture and have two people sitting next to each other and I can say, I want a close up of the guy on the left or a close up of the guy on the right. And with one camera, if the software is available, you could digitally crop and zoom into mm. one person and it'll mm. appear like you've got two cameras. Yeah, but well that's the... Uh, th there's a problem. Th <laughs> the problem Storage. is one camera can't turn and do a side shot <laughs> yep. it can only yep. do the same angle but that for well, some people is enough go on I, I was going to say that I've got also got this little 360 degree camera right oh yeah uh, and I actually quite often use this as a B cam when I'm doing outside interviews oh okay good because you can stick this on a stick um, at, at a different place and it takes a 360 degree picture right. and it gives you very very good B foot very good quality B footage, which you can then move 360, so you can move any angle around you want, right? Okay. So I find that Can I explain, quite... Martin? B footage for the audience means you're doing an interview as we're talking, and you're talking about something, and around the, in the environment that you're in, you might want to get some shots around you to cut mm. into the conversation. So yep. B footage, or they call it B roll, is the footage that you pick up, and then you drop in afterwards during an interview. In this yep. case, you, you've got the availability of control within your own studio to bring up B footage, I suppose, or to bring up extra graphics, etc. Uh, ex ex exactly right. Well, I've shown you some of the, the stuff yes, that I yes, do when I'm yes. live. I, I, I use the sort of the 360 degree camera when I'm re recording 
putting it together. I also yeah. should say that uh, I quite often will make my recordings in 4K, mm -hmm. but I I, all my productions, which are done on um, Adobe, Adobe Premiere, are down to 1080. Yep. Because to put up to YouTube, I find 1080 works really well. And, and so that, again, gives me the opportunity to position and crop in and, and all of those yeah, things. Yeah. Um, but you're right, you can't get the two camera angles unless you actually have two cameras, which is why I find the 360 camera quite useful sometimes, as a, just as an alternative, right? Also, it means that if you're editing and you need to drop in a, a cut, yep. you can do a cross cut, which is quite useful It's a sometimes. lot easier to cross cut than to just do a crop cut. Now, the Correct. reason for that is, imagine I'm saying something as I am right now, and we move on a, couple, a sentence or two, and I want to cut, and now I've mm. gone like this. Yeah. And you cut it and it doesn't work because suddenly my head goes <laughs> very yep. quickly as in the close-up. Yep. Um, so a side shot will actually help cover that to a degree. And that's why Ooh. having more than one camera and having different angles is a good idea. Um, and one of the ways I do that is to have the uh, ability to be able to do the side-by-side uh, -side view, right? Mm -hmm. So I can actually cut. So I've got, in, again, off my panel here, I've got my shot, yep. which is what you're actually seeing live. Um, I've got the zoom that you're recording, but not the picture that we're seeing on the final show, right? Yeah, That's yeah. just, just a, and then I've got this one, which is the side-by-side -side one, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that allows me then also to do other things, like, for example, if I wanted to, I could change the layout, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's all to do with something called super source, right? Yeah, yeah. Which is in the production. And that allows me to give some, uh, a different look. So if I want mm -hmm. to edit, I've got the ability to basically make all of those um, right. changes, right? Now, some little little production tips that um, can be useful for your drone footage, for example, is mm. that we can all take a drone and take a big high shot and we go, wow, look at this great view that we're getting up here. But really, at the end of the day, um, you're not just trying to create a view. It's a motion picture. And the reason yep. that they, this gets into tracking of cameras, by the way, Martin. So what they'll do, for example, is they will look for things when they're tracking cameras, like make sure if you're going to track a camera, find something in the frame that's going to give the, um, the, the view of movement. So if you're going through, there's a whole lot of posts along the side, for example, mm. on the road. You might take the camera and, take, and go along those posts to give extra movement or extra momentum. So imagine somebody's walking and you put the posts in the frame and you walk back with them, you're actually adding a lot more impact to the picture. So this is what the cinematographers do and uh, the filmmakers, they're looking to add more structure to their image to, yep. to keep the content interesting and on the move. So the viewer becomes engaged and doesn't take their eye off the screen. And that's all they're trying to do. They're trying to say, hey, look here, you. <laughs> Um, watch my space and don't go away. We don't want any channel surfers on this channel, so stick around and we'll make it interesting as possible. So there's only two yeah. ways you can make it as interesting as possible. Um, you can make the content enjoyable to watch, or you can talk about a topic that has got everybody mesmerized and they all want to know about it, and they'll stick around as long as you can prove yourself in the first two to three minutes and they'll go, Okay, I think this guy's on the ball. I'm going to listen to what he's got to say. <laughs> well, let's just talk about the Great Reset. That should get people interested oh, for a few minutes. Oh, the Great minutes. Reset. What is it? <laughs> you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. And by the exactly. way, speaking of that, I did come yeah. across um, a little ad done by the Americans or the Canadians. And this a lady starts off, she's probably in her 70s, and she says, there are too many people in the world. The resources just can't extend. We've got to reduce the world population. I have lived a good life. Cut to another person. I have lived a good life. Cut to another person. I have lived a good life. And I'm thinking, have these people got a suicidal kind of fantasy that it's time to leave the planet because the younger generation need to come along and live long? I just looked at it and I thought, am I looking at lunacy? <laughs> I think I kind of have lived a reasonable life. I wouldn't say a great life, but... Um, I'm not ready to, to, to depart no. the planet yet. No, my, my ambition is to be um, a burden on society for another 40 years at least. Oh, you need to live a longer good life. <laughs> I like that. I like to so, say, wouldn't it be great to say to a politician, I intend to receive a pension from you. 
<laughs> exactly. That long pension. And I want to live exactly. a long time while you yeah. keep paying well, the pension. I, I, I worked, um, you know, a good proportion of my life for large organisations. Yep. And my, my theory was, you know, let's say I worked for 35 years or whatever yep. it was, right? My intention is to have the pension that I accumulated with that particular organisation for at least 35 years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. That's my theory, so we'll see. Look, I think the plans are great, Martin, in terms of what you're planning. There is only one problem with this grand plan of a constant economic growth and everything's getting bigger and larger and everyone's becoming richer. And you say, let me see, you can't afford to pay the rent, but the, the economy is wealthy. What is that telling us now, Martin? It's telling us that, I'm sorry, but you didn't keep up. And all that wealth is really going to the top. And there's really not much left for you. <laughs> I had to put that bit in. Yeah, well, we talked about that on our last show, about I the inequality did, yes. and, yeah. and, and the fact that that's a, you know, one of the big things I'm very concerned about. I mean, I am concerned about the, the fact that we have finite resources on the planet and we've got to find a way of working within you know, the, the arc we've got rather than um, two arcs, right? Because oh, yeah, effectively yeah. there's only one planet's worth of stuff. Um, but uh, there are things that can be done. Look, George, you know what it's would be really nice, Martin? Yeah. As you say about what you just said. Hmm. Uh, yeah, we've got so much stuff. And what gets me is, and yes, it is finite, but it seems to me it's not just that we're producing stuff. We're producing stuff that doesn't last deliberately right. so that you'll continue to buy stuff. And so we, we're on this kind of like on a tread wheel, uh, treadmill or whatever it is, and we're just buying stuff for the sake of buying it. But whatever happened to quality? Just buy it yep. once and you've got what you need. And okay, 10 years down the track, maybe, uh, it can become technologically redundant. But get 10 years use out of it. And what do we get? We, you buy a camera. Oh, Martin, your A9 camera has just been superseded. And it's Correct. two years old already. Do you know it's old? And I you know. think, oh, great, here we go. We've got still upgrades. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah. It still works. I'm, I, you know, I, I'm a great believer in trying to buy stuff that is going to last rather than actually fall over. And also, by the way, I didn't tell you this, but I will now. Um, I run the whole uh, of my studio on, on what's called SDI cables, which are the oh, yeah, professional. No. Right? I have made all my SDI cables. So basically, I bought the uh, I the bought the, um, the the co the coax. Right? I know what you're talking about. I bought the coax. Yes, yes. Right? I put and the plugs on the end. You terminate yeah. the ends with and, the BNC and did all the terminations. Uh, I was talking talking the other day to um, somebody who represents one of the big um, mm -hmm. uh, firms who sell a lot of kits, and they were very impressed. This this was the CEO. Very impressed that I actually had turned my hand to the physical reduction of cables. Right? Yep. But the point was, uh, I'd, I've cabled my whole studio for about a tenth of the cost of actually going and buying pre-cut cables and they're all the right length. Yes, of course, of course, that's correct. Now, I, <laughs> I get where you're coming from, Martin. And the other thing, of course, is if you go out on a job or you have to work in the field and a cable gets damaged and suddenly you've got a 100 metre cable and there's one little connector at the end that's, got, that's broken and yep. you need to use it, you can actually cut off like an inch of it, re-terminate yep. it in the field that cable's yep. now working again, and you're act up and running. Whereas me, Absolutely. I just yep. say, Mother, help me. <laughs> Somebody. <laughs> yeah, well, you. I, always, I always take my um, termination kit when I go out and uh, you know, as uh, I do, wise do shows. Move. Right? Wise because move. Be, because uh, a few years ago, I was actually recording um, at quite a big event, and I tripped over the SDI cable and pulled the thing right out the camera, right? Uh, right. <laughs> so <laughs> I know what can happen. So, and and then the final thing, I just just complete the picture. One of the other questions which people might be asking is, how am I getting the zoom, uh, the zoom call into the system, right? Because I'm actually recording you, although you are recording your end, and you're going to actually edit your well, picture into, you into our lot, show. So correct. For, correct. For you to edit, but so. at the moment, I'm actually recording the zoom so I can actually do this and actually put up what I'm seeing at the moment right yep so I've actually got my um, PC mirroring mm -hmm. right 
this particular screen, and that yep. is then going through an, um, an HDI, HDMI to SDI converter, yep. so that it converts into another stream mm -hmm. that goes into my switcher. Mm -hmm. That's the first point. And then the second point is how am I sending my picture back to you? Mm -hmm. uh, I've also got another device that takes the SDI output from the production switcher yep. and converts it back to a USB and appears to be a web webcam. Right. So you've actually and live, you're live streaming in effect. Correct. So I'm live streaming direct back to you over the USB port over Zoom, right? And um, those are the things that actually are required to be able to actually bring a Zoom call in and to be able to actually interact with Zoom <laughs> while, while we're producing. So, I mean, the, the more you think about this, the more you realize that this is quite a complicated jigsaw puzzle, right? Oh, no, no. That's a good point, folks. Uh, he said it right. It's a complicated jigsaw puzzle. It's one thing to get your uh, phone out and, and take a picture. <laughs> it's another thing to take probably three or four cameras and sound sources and graphics and, mm. um, and uh, B-roll footage if you need to, and another person on the other end, and make it all come together. And it looks simple on the surface, yeah. but let me tell you... <laughs> It's and to get the colour balance right, as we discussed earlier oh, on, yeah, and, the sound, and, the, and the sound balance and everything. So, yep. so there's a lot of moving parts, <laughs> but the point is that you never notice it unless it goes wrong. Well, that's the thing. Um, if it's done really well, uh, again, it's about reducing distraction. So reducing distraction is making sure that things don't go wrong, and then the focus is on the topic... And then we, it's up to us to make sure that we produce good content so that the audience out there goes, well, I don't agree with everything they say, but they do raise some interesting questions. And some people will think, oh, they're political. Now, I can assure you the last one we did had nothing to do with politics. It had everything to do with just looking at the system for what it is and really asking the questions as to what do we see. I don't particularly care for politics, it bores me by the way, but, but just the same, it needed to be addressed and that's what we did. But Martin, you do a, a really interesting operation where you are and um, I think uh, it's about the best I've seen from a YouTuber. It's not to say there aren't others, but I've never seen, I rarely see a YouTuber actually do it the way you do it. I see TV stations doing it the way you do it. Because, and what do they have? They have crews and they have huge budgets. And to be honest, I mean, if we went back 20, 30 years and you asked Martin, Martin, do you think you can run a TV studio? He'd probably say, well, if you can put two or three million dollars on the table, uh, yeah, I think we could probably do it with two or three million dollars. Uh, today, what would the figure be more likely, Martin? Uh, I, I can see you got a serious kit, so I'm going to guess here. Do up the way up the bits and pieces. Mm, Seventy, probably yeah. with everything. It's probably less than that because I never buy new. Okay, well that's different. Okay, if it's not new, <laughs> we're probably we could reduce that by twenty-five, thirty thousand. So yeah, maybe forty. I, 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 I reckon. If you wanted to sort of do it from scratch yep. with new kit, then you're right, 70 to 90 yeah, probably. Yeah. But, okay. uh, well, my, I've only got 2K lot, uh, cameras. I don't have any 4K yeah. cameras, Martin. Ma yeah. I'm well, jealous. Mine, my mine's, a, mine's a lot less than that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, basically the way I've done it is that I've grown the technical side in line with the revenue I've generated off the channel. Right? Yep, yep, so yep. I don't make a profit, but what I do is to fold the money back into essentially just building a little bit more production value so and maybe, so the most maybe taking a walk around the world occasionally although we can't uh, do that because of COVID-19 I can't, can't do that at the moment but uh, walk the world of course originally started out as yes. a channel where I showed all of my um, travels around the world and I used to take my cameras and record mm -hmm. the walks that I used to take and right. in fact on the production channel uh, where we're, we'll probably put this video up there's a bunch of other videos there okay. including a lot where I've walked around the world. So that's where Walk the, world, Walk the World came from. And then I just thought, well, I'll repurpose the channel. Mm -hmm. Hence the name. So that's how we got to where we got to. Now, well, George, it's been fa fascinating I'll, chatting one with last you. last tip before we go? Yeah. Okay. yeah, go on. Looking at a frame, yep. just so you know. 
what I do when I'm looking at a frame is I look for the greatest amount of contrast I can have mm -hmm. in the frame. It's the checkerboard theory, if you know yep. what a checkerboard looks like. And I look for, as you can see, this side of my face, you'll see it on my camera, see? Uh, this side is a bit dark and this side's a bit bright. And in an ideal world, I want the, the frame to, I want what, the light around this side of the face to be quite dark and I want the light on the darker side to be quite bright. And so what that does, it, cr it creates a shape. And that's what I'm looking for. So you know what the cathedral door opening is like. So why do photographers put people right in the middle of the cathedral door? They're trying to create a shape. And mm. they're trying to create... They don't stick half their body over the edge of the door. They make sure that there's a distinct edge around everything. And that's what helps them create an interesting image. And, that's, and when you do that in motion picture, then you block everything and then you look at the pictures as they come, as they cut, and you go, I want that person to stand right here because when we go to this point, camera B over here will be on a close-up and the frame behind them looks perfect because they hit their mark. If they go off the mark, oh, ruined the frame, doesn't work. Take two, everybody, let's go for a take two. <laughs> okay, Martin. Shall we finish? Yep. Yeah, I think that's uh, been a very interesting conversation, George. Thanks for that. And I would just make one final point about the lights. I have actually messed around with the relative power of all the four lights okay. to try and get a little bit of definition, but not too much. And because I'm also trying to get an even pattern of light. And you've stopped, um, the, you've stopped the reflection in your glasses too by raising the lights up? Correct. Yes, okay. exactly right. That's important. And that, that was one of the most critical things. If I do that, Yes, you can uh, see you can see the you reflection. Can see, but you have to go quite a long way, and yeah. so generally um, it works quite well. And neither do you see the reflection of the computer screens and those sorts oh, of good, things, good. which Excellent. is something else. Though. Excellent, Mark. Well, I appreciated the, uh, the chance to explore some of that with you, George. I learned a few things on the way, and I uh, hope some of the audience have found that uh, helpful as well. I've had a few people ask for more information about the way the studio works. So uh, thanks very much, and uh, I'll look forward to picking up with you again. We'll probably have to go down that rabbit hole once more. Yes, don't worry, we'll be back, folks, with the rabbit hole. <laughs> it certainly creates, creates a bit of friction, and I love friction. <laughs> yep. Well, Thank you, Martin. So, thanks, George. See you next time. Cheers. Yeah, very philosophical, Martin. Bye. <laughs> Cheers, bye.